The week in Monterey and Pebble Beach and Cadillac makes waves with its El Mirage concept. Other design, important design elements that we're going to talk about this week. And the two Porsches coming up next. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by the 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Learn more at Hyundai.com. This is AutoLine After Hours with Peter DiLorenzo, episode 207 for Friday, August 23rd, 2013. Cadillac by Design. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2200 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Well, welcome, everyone. We're here. Uh, I'm Peter DiLorenzo, the auto extremist. John is away. I'm joined by Mr. Jim Hall from 2953 Analytics and the Design Handbook from AutoLine. And we also welcome Joe Demacia from Automobile, the deputy editor of Automobile. And we're real pleased to have Joe. Thanks for having me. Welcome, guys. So, uh, Jim, you weren't out there, but you, you'll have plenty to say anyway. Uh, <laughs> Joe, we were out in California. And uh, what were your highlights for you, really? What do you think stood out? Well, the Cadillac Mirage, El, sorry, El Mirage concept was definitely the big, you yeah. know, new. I was sniffing for something new, um, even though it's all about old there. And uh, that was cool to see that. And quite frankly, you and I were there with uh, another luxury mark from Detroit, Lincoln, yeah, which didn't have something quite as exciting. Uh, so it even underscored more the importance of Cadillac being there with El Mirage. Looked great. I, we had seen advanced photos uh, a day or two earlier, and I was just stunned. Yeah, um, it's, it's up on the screen for our viewers. It uh, has tremendous presence. It's finished off just exceedingly well. I, I was thinking it's very hard for new cars to exist on the peninsula during that weekend because there's so much gorgeous old sheet metal, and I thought that car... It, it, it exists very comfortably. Not that I, it looks old. But I will it, beg to defer. Special new cars are just as good there, whether the Conqueror's on or not. Um, the first n non standard Ferrari Enzo I ever saw was out there. It was a silver special Enzo. Special new cars, that, yes. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Regular cars, the, yeah. The, the manufacturer booths, they're kind of like, oh. yeah, those are nice, but. There's so much else to look at. Yeah, I mean, look, it's an Infiniti Q50. Wasn't right. that a Detroit? Yeah, exactly. That's but right. special cars, Joe, are always yeah. special there. And in some ways, for some brands, I think it's, it's, it's a good venue for them because they can, if they want, they can play with their heritage. Although, I mean, yeah, I agree. Although at, <laughs> at some juncture, I wrote about this, the quail seem to veer over into the commercial world a little to the extreme. The I mean, quail's it, corporate now. There were, yeah, there were still some fabulous cars there. There really were. Including the Peter Brock collection. Yeah, the Peter Brock collection. And any time I get to see the original Stingray, which GM calls the 59 Stingray racer, I just call it the original Stingray. Uh, any time I get to see that in person, it's a good show. But there was, some, there was a lot of good stuff there, but there was kind of some weird stuff, too, that didn't, I didn't think belonged there. But, you know. Was that the venue to show the new special edition. I mean, the idea of saying Bugatti Viron and special edition in the same phrase is sort of weird, but, yes. but yeah. was that, is that the proper venue for showing that car, for example? It was there. Yeah. And it, would you agree that's a good venue for that kind of a car? Sure. You didn't ask me if it was a good car. You asked that's me. a whole other issue. <laughs> <laughs> We're know, talking about Pebble, not the car. I actually drove to the Quail with Robert Comerford, our design editor, and he was driving and I had just received the press release on the Bugatti. And so I was reading him the press release. And it was uh, pretty comical for him, uh, you know, inspired by the, what, 1927? Well, no. that, that, that connection with yeah. Bugatti is ethereal. <laughs> I mean, this is a car that is the, that is the Concorde of automobiles, and you can't draw a connection to anything that, that even has drum brakes. Right, right. You know, and, uh, you know, I think Lincoln found out the hard way that 
you know, the, uh, the personalization, personalization they have going on is quite handsome. Uh, what this they, is the black label stuff. The black right. label stuff is nicely executed, and, uh, you know, it's, it shows very well. But when I heard that Cadillac was going to have a concept there, and Lincoln didn't have one, then, you know, Lincoln was overshadowed. And, uh, I was disappointed because I was expecting Lincoln to have a car. I knew Cadillac was going to have a car. Yeah. My mind was churning with editorial coverage of these two American luxury marks going head to head in this. I mean, you're brave to go in that into venue, this realm. especially, yeah. Very brave. And, you know, so. <clears throat> That was my bigger disappointment with the lack of a real car from Lincoln. Um, and that's a product. Lincoln does need something to sort of set what Lincoln is. And it can't be their entry-level sedan. No. Well, they have a couple, couple uh, problems. One is product cadence. A couple. Yeah, <laughs> a couple, several. Uh, one is product cadence, which is crucial. And, yep. and the other, for many people, until they see a proper big Lincoln, they won't believe Lincoln's back. And I would think all the more so for China, and Lincoln had invited uh, a number of Chinese media and dealers to their program, and, and they were very open about the fact that Black Label is, is, a, is as much as anything an a entree to the Chinese market. It's a play to China. But um, I was chauffeured in the back of a Lincoln MKZ from SFO to Monterey, and let me tell you, it's not a car to be chauffeured in because there's not bird in the back of a Lincoln MKZ from SFO hey, to Monterey. Hey, Ben, we're getting and feedback you, here. It's not a car to be chauffeured in because there's not bird Big in the back of a Lincoln MKZ. <laughs> ah, good. I do like the excitement loops, though. It keeps us on our toes. <laughs> well, it makes us all seem like we're robots. <laughs> makes us all seem like we're robots. What do you mean, <laughs> seem? <laughs> The, the, the black label thing's interesting, too, because it isn't real personalization in the way that is done by Audi, Porsche. You know, they, they don't do bespoke yet. No. And no. those guys all do bespoke. They're selling this as an affordable way to be different, yeah. whereas those cost five-figure money, maybe. Um, no, I mean, this, this, you know, the Porsche key, painted red. Peter, how much extra? $330, Jim. A mere bagatelle for a Lincoln owner. <laughs> <laughs> but Lincoln, uh, uh, they've curated, is their term, uh, three, three uh, looks. looks for the MKZ, and they'll do similar packages for, for other vehicles. Version. But, yeah, there's not an infinite variety. The it's, red headliner in the, the car I don't get. I, that that's, one is Foxfire. That's inspired by a, um, f a fox fur collar on a woman's coat. We it would be like a fox fur hat if it's a headliner. Well, you're, the, good point. Okay, uh, I mean a collar would be like the the, the upper the instrument up, panel in the show. Yeah, all the but, color is inspired. But I'm you know. sorry, it just it's one of those things. It's it's <laughs> like why dogs do certain things that they can do that humans can't. <laughs> uh, probably the more tasteful one was I don't the one with the light the light almost off off white or bone interior. Well, that was nice, and that was uh, that was a follow up to the MKC concept right. from Detroit, mm -hmm. similar interior. I think um, the in, you're talking about in the chocolate dogs. one. Yeah. Oh yeah. So because in, it was inspired right. by chocolate with brown, and you know, I did point out in my piece that, that brown is not exactly a new thing for automotive coloring okay. recently, yeah. but I like brown. So uh, those of us who were hanging with Lincoln through the weekend, because it was inspired by chocolate, everywhere we went all weekend there was chocolate. Um, but not no fox collar. No fox, fox for oh, collars. But come on. But there was chocolate. <clears throat> I will say this um, about the whole week. Uh, Someone at Cadillac decided to paint the El Mirage color and interior is my all-time favorite color combination, that dark oh, blue. With blue with like an, an, analyzed, an undyed saddle color almost. Yeah, yeah that's nice. It's just, you know. I was thinking about blue at the Pebble Beach Concours because there were a lot of really good-looking blue cars. And I remember last year taking, being drawn to blue cars, old cars. Uh, this year there was a Talbo Lago in blue. Didn't you send us? What My you... favorite car was a uh, an American Roadster, 99 years old, and which was in a beautiful pale blue with the huge yeah, white is. wheels. There it is. Yeah. American Underslung. That's an American yes, Underslung. Underslung. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I just thought That's that what, was 1905 or so, right? Uh, no, 1913, I believe. Okay. Um, and uh, I just thought that was stunning. Just because it was, it had so much wow. Um, yeah. 
Not that it's that. Double dubs, 40-inch wheels. Yeah, they're huge, mm -hmm. huge. And a cool logo. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, the, out there is something because uh, you're tripping over fabulous cars everywhere you go. I mean, that real live people own and drive up there. Uh, I walked out of the hotel and there was a Ferrari F50 park nose to tail with a... With an Enzo. Right. I well, one of those is that. a good car and the other one is just an incredibly cynical way of prying cash away from wealthy people with no sense and of... And another morning I walked out and there was a white F458 Italia with a zebra print wrap on it. Mm. Black zebra stripes. I have a picture on my... I should have put it on the It was site. A, a coupe? Yeah. But it wasn't velvet, because there was a similar one with velvet in London recently. No, no, no. Um, um, and it was still dark, and I walked out of the hotel, and I thought, I was seeing things, <laughs> but, but it was, in fact, zebra-stripe wrapped. I Instagrammed the, a picture of those two Ferraris, and it got more reaction than any other Instagram picture I did all weekend. Mm -hmm. But, the F50 uh, was just such an abominable automobile. They were horrid cars. You know, I that. I've was, never driven an Enzo either. Enzos are amazing. They're real cars. The Enzo is one of those things, other than the $9,000 oil change or whatever. But, well, uh, one thing about the Quail that, you know, it always amazed me. There, were, there was a group of Ferraris that parked off on their own little private thing that was all organized. And I never get over this. When I see 30 of the latest Ferraris parked together, doesn't look so special anymore. Exactly. Everything you know, loses its impact a bit. But that started, I think, with the 308. Well, I mean, you know. The, the 308 was the car that became the, the sort of the, 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 the cane and token Ferrari. The very latest. F12s. Uh, Even a multiple F12s don't look. Cause I, see, I've only seen one F12 in the tin, and it was pretty spectacular. To me. Oh, it is spectacular. <clears> but, I mean, there was, you know, there was a black Enzo. There were F12s. There was an even an FF. And, mm. But when you see them all parked together, it's... Mm. Too much red? It's just too many, you know, it's, they're not so special anymore. The, the best Ferraris are never red. I saw a blue... I can't remember if it's a 355 or 456 or something. I, I, just on the road, to and from the quail. Looked really good on the road. Pale blue. You can there, tell I like pale blue. There was a stunning uh, cream yellow uh, Tour de France. Oh. In the paddock. Like the cigarette cream kind of, yeah, uh, that would be gorgeous. At the, uh, in the paddock at Laguna. Uh, there was an XK120 in that color at the quail. That was old English white. That was very common for 120s, 140s, and 150s. Um, but you didn't see it often on a Ferrari. No. But no. that's a, something you never get over at, at that week is, you know, and then I walked around the corner and there was an SL. Uh, there were so many SL Roadsters, which I like more than the going. We're, we're my, my, my advice to anybody who's on the peninsula that weekend who cannot afford or cannot get a ticket to the quail because it's extremely expensive. It's $500 it's and a, they sell out. It's more. Or more. 750 It's worth just coming to the quail and parking and walking on the parking lot. Yeah. The parking lot alone has. Yeah, the parking lot was, you know, incredible. amazing uh, sheet metal. So it's a great weekend. No doubt about it. Um, and then, of course, the thing that is sometimes the highlight and should always be the highlight, you gotta, you got to do the historic races. Yeah, I mean, uh, Laguna, just... Laguna was cool. Uh, I mean, every time you go, there's just stunning cars there. And, uh, and you get to see them moving. Yeah, yes. and it's loud. And it's funny, though, and I wrote about this in the motorsports column, that you go out to uh, Laguna and, you know, all that money and everything, and probably half the people who go there to the track drove and very expensive of the latest stuff, probably imported stuff. What's the biggest crowd pleaser Corvette. at any time? Anything with the big V8s, the Trans Am cars. The, the Can-Am Can cars are cars, always amazing. Corvettes, Cobras. It's, and Corvette had a nice display there. Yeah, they very did. Nice very nice. Very nice. They had each uh, generation car had its corresponding racer with it. And uh, one of my brother's cars was on there for the uh, 60. But speaking of cars moving, I saw a uh, bit of the tour, the Pebble Beach tour, which is on Thursday morning. Yeah. Um, saw it kind of pull into Carmel. Um, and uh, these are all the cars, or a lot of the cars that are at the Concorde. Right. And I had never seen that before. And that's 
totally worth doing in a way to see all the cars that are going to be the Concorde without some, paying for the Concorde. And more importantly, you and can probably see them, see them better, too, than yeah, the Concorde. Oh yeah, they, they roll into Ocean Avenue and Carmel, and they park for about an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah, I, I like can, that, too. That's... To me, that if you stick well, around, you can watch them roll out, or if you get there early yeah. enough, you can watch them roll in. So yeah, it was just uh, one highlight after another out there, and uh, just walking around wherever it just reinforced uh, my belief that design is the ultimate initial product differentiator, and will even grow in importance going forward because it's the first thing you see, the first thing you see out there, and I don't care what era it's from, you just Great design grabs your eye and holds your attention and sells cars. Sells cars still true today. That's why, you know, when Cadillac showed the CL a couple of years ago, it was the same impact, and then they come back with the El Mirage. Uh, you know, they get it out there, and we're going to have someone from GM Design coming up real shortly. But one more thing what are you driving of late? I'm driving the 911 Carrera 4S, which I wrote about in the site. It's very cool, very fast. Yesterday evening, I drove the new, the facelifted E-Class Mercedes sedan, 4Matic E350. I kind of like the front end. It's maybe a little overwrought, but I'm kind of... I, I, but they're throwing away their heritage grill in that car. There's only one version of it that has the traditional Mercedes they throw it away a long grill. time ago? Yeah, no. No. But they, I'm talking about the normal, traditional grill. They, it's only on one model of the new E-Class. Uh, everything else has basically the SL-style grill. Yeah. Oh, with the huge, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. With that's the, the, her with the heritage grill. They, I mean, they, oh, that's theirs. They, they, when you walk away from it the way they are, and it's for North America only. So we're, they're reflecting the market here. Which, which uh, wants the, the three-pointed star to be as big as possible. Yeah, and illuminated as a, as a dealer accessory now. Yeah, that's a bit much. The wrapper market, oh, yes. That's a bit much. You know, I, I wrote about this, but driving the 911, it just, you know, Porsche's kind of the the dichotomy going on inside Porsche is interesting. You know, they're making money hand over fist. What do they sell most of? Cayennes followed by Panameras. That allows them, in their minds, to fund... 911s, Caymans, and Boxsters. 918s, the Le Mans program. And, you know, it's clear that at some point... If customers only have exposure to uh, Cayennes and Panameras, generally speaking, generally yeah. speaking, uh, and they they really really don't know what Porsche is about. They just that's their exposure. Eventually, those people will outnumber the people who have an affinity for. It'll dilute their DNA. Yeah, it's inevitable. So uh, it's interesting this tightrope they're walking, and uh, <laughs> well, the Cayman I've driven both the regular and the Cayman S in recent weeks. They're both brilliant. Um, they, they, they leave me thinking I could be happy with this rather than a 911. I'd get a Cayman S over a 911. The um, biggest mistake they made when they brought the Cayman out was not to use the 911 front fascia on it and market it as a 911 GT. By doing that alone, they could have probably gotten five or six K more for the car, just, just that way. And it would have allowed them to put to bed the thing about don't make the Cayman too good because it can't be better than a 911. They had that opportunity. But they can make an extra five grand just by painting the key. So. No, 330, <laughs> 330. 330. No, but the point is this, this, it would have allowed them to position the car differently, where it would have gotten more money, it would have justified whatever they want to do with it. But so a 3.8 liter 911. They I, might have alienated all the 911 purists. And no, I don't think so. Because the, the purists, the real purists are 9 are, are, are they're, they're alienated every time a new 911 comes out. Mm. They're alienated by the 991 because it's so big. By the way, your car was on display, Jim. The 50th anniversary 911. I love the 50th anniversary 911. I looked up close. Boy, is it spectacular. Boy, they did a nice job on it. And I was told that I probably could get one in golf blue, but not golf. It's golf blue. They're, it's the blue they actually did the original 911. What does that company. start at? What is that going to start at? It's uh, over 100 because in the States, we get it with a power kit. It's the only market that gets it with a standard power kit. I so thought it was going to be around 140 or something. It's over 100. I just, yeah. 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 It ain't cheap. So it's interesting. They're walking this tightrope. We'll see how it goes. I mean, but what's their new product news? A fresh Panamera and the Macan. A whole bunch of Panamera models. Uh, hybrid, uh, longer wheelbase. Oh, the, well, the executive is the, being done for China. The China. Yeah. And yeah. my but, attitude on that, they should not sell that in the U.S. But they are, aren't they? Yeah, they're, yeah. Doing, they're doing a an S and a turbo. 
they only have two models of the long wheelbase. Mm. Uh, and that it, yeah, and I think I have to agree with Peter. It's two models more than they should be. But a, uh, an amazing number of trim lines oh, yeah. for that car in America. I can't, I can't even well, keep track it's, of it's, them. It's actually, it's amazing, and it isn't. Now it matches uh, what they're doing for the, uh, for the Cayenne. Well, the Cayenne is the same thing. Yeah, but, well, no, it's actually more because they have two-wheel drive versions of the, uh, of the Panamera. Yeah. Well, you know what, this is a good point to take a break. You know, Ben, uh, let's hear from our friends at Bridgestone, and we're going to bring our special guest up. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. Legendary durability. Impressive mileage. Firestone tires. So unstrap the saddle. These old stallions are ready to run again. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Whether it's on television, online, or through social media, AutoLine knows how to effectively get your marketing message to the people you want to reach. Contact Stacy Eman today. Okay, welcome back. Uh, our special guest tonight is uh, one of the true believers in the business, uh, Mr. Bob Boniface, who's Chief of Exterior Design for Cadillac. And as you know by now, one of our favorite subjects on the show is anything to do with design. And Bob, welcome. It's good to see you. Peter, it's great to be here. Now, Bob has a long history with uh, design. He's also an Italian car freak. A little bit. You have some alphas. I have some alphas, more, <laughs> more than I care to mention. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Bob also brought with him uh, the new CTS, which is uh, really looks great. And the best thing about the CTS is it's all fresh and new, and it's bigger, and it's lighter, which is fantastic. That's magic when you can do that. Well, for General Motors, I mean, this kind of, kind of reverses a long, except for the Corvette, a long string of, you know, heavier and heavier cars. and it's, How um, much lighter is it? It's about 300 pounds lighter. It's 300 pounds lighter than the previous car. And it's, it's bigger, and the other thing is it's, it's meeting much tougher standards now for crash, so... And you think about who we're trying to sell the car to, who the competition is. You know, this is a driver's car. And so a lot of people's impression of Cadillac is, is the impression they had from the car that their father or their grandparents had, that it was a luxury liner, you know, luxury by the pound. Um, that's not where the money is today. And so we had to, we had to be best in segment. We couldn't, good enough is not good enough. So took the weight out of the car, it's the aluminum hood, aluminum doors. Um, lots of aluminum and uh, other nice metals in the underbody to keep the mass down. And, of course, the powertrains, a lot of power. The twin turbos coming out later this year is the V-Sport, which um, I'm supposed to get one of those at the end of September. This one is actually Dave Leone's car. The this is a two-liter, isn't it? This is a two-liter turbo, and it's actually, the car runs great. I'm, I'm driving it home tonight, by the way, so don't mess it up. <laughs> um, and don't mess it up because Dave will be angry with me. But, uh, yeah, the, each of the powertrains, great specific output. And um, dynamically, they're fantastic. Well, another interesting thing is with the ATS, you had to you had to move the CTS up mm -hmm. because the ATS is, you know, you had in the market now the ATS and the current CTS are kind of bumping into each other. So this will yeah. bring the CTS up. Makes the ATS a three series and the CTS well, a five series. Yeah. And I think the the CTS in the first generation, the second generation, always suffered from. If we're going to use the BMW Lexicon 357. It was always a four. It it was, yeah, because it, it was it would it between was, the it, two. It was in between yeah. the two. It was it was size closer to a five, but right. price closer to a three. So positioning the car that tough. always makes it tough. It we was, did a, it was always tough. When the last CTS came out in 07, I went on the launch, which was at the Nurburgring, which was fun. You can take us back, uh, <laughs> and we did a comparison on the back of that with a Mercedes C and a, uh, a BMW 3, and we struggled with that. And our readers called us on it even. You know, they're like, "Well, you're comparing, and this is bigger." And, uh, but and we're like, "Well, it's kind of, you know." It, but it was priced like the other cars. Exactly. Exactly. And it goes back to the old, well, you know, do you sell a Cadillac as a value proposition? You know, we're selling a three series price, but you know, and I that's not what luxury is about. That's not what luxury is about, and so. Um, this market has very specific size requirements, both with respect to the exterior and the interior accommodations, and, and the interior appointments and powertrain, and all those other things have to come along with it. This car is a true 
um, leader in the segment when you drive it. I, I hold this car up against any of the competitors in build quality, in chassis dynamics, in design, of course, because that's the part that I control. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful car, and we expect great things from it. It's in the first market. time I've really spent time looking at those wheels. Those are this is our. The, that is a great look. This wheel. is this yeah, is the accessory 19-inch wheel. This is an accessory. Yeah, it's an optional 19-inch. Oh, okay. Wheel. I mean, accessory sometimes I think of a dealer, an SPO thing. Well, we do the we do the optional wheels in a couple ways. Sometimes we do an RPO where they're factory installed. Yeah. Sometimes they're dealer installed. And sometimes, depending on the volume, we'll do a dealer installed wheel. So this would be a dealer installed wheel, but it's you still check the box and you get it on the car. You have a thin five-spoke dealer installed wheel for the ATS, don't you? Thin five it, it, spoke? It's five spoke, but the, the spokes seem very thin. I saw it at the auto show, well, but there was only one of them with those wheels. At, it's, 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 a, it's sort of a martini glass shape is what we call it. Right. At the, that's at, yeah. a sport wheel, but that's a, that's a, Better, that's a standard RPO okay. wheel. I don't yeah. see many of those here. You yeah. know, the interesting thing about, you know, Cadillac's been on this journey since 98 uh, when they showed the Evoke. What was the Evoke show? 99, concert, I think. 99, 99 yeah. at the Detroit mm -hmm. show. And they've been on this journey for... Almost 15 almost years. Almost 15 years. And, um, you know, before that, uh, you were just coming off the land of Vogue white wall tires, and you had a dealer body that, you know, tarted up the cars, and you were nowhere. So it's been a long, long journey to reposition the brand. And... But the interesting thing, I wrote about this a, a couple months ago, and the interesting thing about the El Mirage to me is I, we all get it now that Cadillac, yeah, they, they want to compete with BMW, they want to compete with Mercedes. They, they, they went after that positioning, the, the driver's machine. Mm -hmm. But um, a couple months ago, I, I thought about it. It's, maybe it's time for Cadillac. When I see the El Mirage, it's time for Cadillac to, it's okay to be Cadillac. And I think you guys are getting at that. And when I saw the El Mirage, it reaffirmed what I saw on the CL, and that is, this is something, this is a car that Cadillac can do. You, See, that's the thing. No one else. The El Mirage no is a car, BMW can't do they that can't. car. Well, yeah. you, you think of the, we, we always talk about the German brands, BMW, Audi, Mercedes, and they're very good at what they do, but there's a, it's, they're a little cold and impersonal, if in a way. And the way we're positioning Cadillac, we talk about art and science, which is the movement that we've been on for 15 years or so. And it really is the art and science. You know, the science of the powertrain, the science of the user interface, the science of how we build these cars, but the artistic nature of how the interior is all cut and sew. Um, you look at the hood of this car, and, and you just see the romance, the creases and the, and the soft forms. It is a car that only Cadillac can do. And um, yeah, that, that was my point, though, is I, I know you guys um, can dial up a car to go head to head with the Germans on the Nurburgring, if that's what you want to do. You can do a V series car. Um, and Joe, you, you know, your magazine have documented that journey. They, you know, they're, they're, to me, a CTS V Coupe is an awesome car. And, I drove uh, here tonight, actually. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know if I would take a German, a BMW or Mercedes over that. I don't think I would, or an Audi. I would get a CTS V Coupe. But, but you need a coupe off this vehicle. You really do. Yeah. And it would be spectacular. Mm -hmm. But you need a coupe off the new car. But at some point, my point is, at some point, I think it's okay for Cadillac to say, okay, we went, we, we did the German thing, and maybe it's time for us to... Be an American luxury. Yeah, be car, Cadillac. Not, not, not apologize for it. Yeah, yeah. Not trying. Right. What do you what, think? Also, of that, what he's getting at is we're, we're wondering when we're going to see the production sedan of an El Mirage, a big, brash, bold American luxury Cadillac. You're expecting me to give you that answer? Of on course this we show. are. <laughs> see, there's, there's, a, there's a thing that's happened since this has all been going on, and that's that BMW has been the centroid for Mercedes, where Mercedes, Mercedes used to build cars like a W116 S-Class, a car that would roll over anything smoothly, comfortably, and it could still hold its own on a winding road. Mm -hmm. But everybody's going mm -hmm. for a driver's car, and in a lot of cases, that means that the refined luxury car that rides well and does handle well is secondary because we want it to handle well and rides deteriorating, even Lexus. I mean, the LS400, when it came out, was one of those cars you couldn't believe you could make a car that quiet. You couldn't believe you could make a car that rode like it did. Now, it didn't handle as well as the German cars, but now the technology exists to do both. The problem is that Mercedes is still, in its own way, kind of 
chasing the, the, the driver yeah, centroid. Right. And they've opened up a part of the market for somebody to go in there. Right. What scares me is the guys who are in the position that could probably see it and maybe do something is unfortunately the guys that build Hyundais. They don't have the branding for it. Yeah. But, but yeah. what I'm saying is that, that there's an argument that Cadillacs don't all have to be Vs. And you know, what the interesting thing is uh, BM, even BMW and Volkswagen, Audi, for as great of corp companies as they are, they had to go outside and buy Rolls-Royce in, in BMW's case and, and Bentley in the case of uh, VW Audi to actually get to that. To learn about luxury. Well, to get to that romance position in the premium, in the luxury space. But um, they haven't trickled those down yeah, into Audi or... I'll, I'll tell you a funny, funny story. This is a few years ago now. Um, we did some luxury research. We're always doing clinic work. And we went to New York, went to L.A., we went to Shanghai, we went to Beijing. And we talk about positioning of, of vehicles. We had Rolls Royces there, Bentleys there, BMWs there, uh, S550s there. And we said, well, you know, look at a, a Rolls Royce or something like that. And you say, well, what would you say if Lexus had a car like that. And they said, no, they don't have any pedigree. I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy it. And then we sort of hold our breath and we say, uh, what about if um, Cadillac did it? And they said, yeah, you know, Cadillac used to build cars like that, you know. Sure, you guys have pedigree. I'd look at a car like that. So it's very interesting in the customer's eyes that even though a lot of them see that there were we had failings in the past, perhaps. You still have heritage. We have heritage that other companies heritage don't have. Heritage and history. Heritage and history. And, and so we have to be careful that we cultivate that and you know these are the, the family jewels right right so this is the heart of the the luxury space performance luxury but we're always mindful that there's there are other places to go that, that for Cadillac well you know it's interesting too for Lincoln Lincoln can be an American luxury car that doesn't have to go do the Germanic thing. They still make those, and, and I and and they. Ooh. That's exactly what they should be. But they, no one expects a Lincoln to be a hard, keen. And to their credit, they didn't go down that road. But they're emphasizing design. But now they need to show. They need a star they, to design. They need around. a commitment to Lincoln on a multi-decade basis. You need a dedicated family of architectures. You can't build Lincolns, bespoke Lincolns, off of. Ford platforms. I'm but, speaking as an outsider here, of course. Yeah. But the problem is, remember, that yeah. Ford and Mr. Mullally, it's about one Ford, and it's about reducing complexity. And the problem is, everything you need to do to make a luxury nameplate and set it in the market and build it is, compl is adding complexity. The customer doesn't care about that. Well, exactly. That's the point. Especially the luxury. That's Ford's problem. But, right. But yeah. the thing is, when you're a company where you don't want that to happen, that tells you you're never going to be able to get to a position to execute it correctly. So they either have to do it or dump Lincoln. And they claim they're going to keep Lincoln. Well, and if they're going to keep Lincoln, they got to spend. They're relaunching Lincoln. It? Think about it. They're relaunching Lincoln. Why did Lincoln need relaunching? Because it was dead. Why was it dead? Because, because they, they ignored it. And that they're in the potential where that could happen again. It could happen with Cadillac. You could have GM in 25 years in a position where they think it's less important. Because one of the, that's the that's the saddest part about these big corporations. They there's no way of instilling what we're going to do over an extremely long period of time when management changes. Well, the biggest problem in the corporations is you have the true believers in uh, product development, design, engineering. And marketing. And marketing. And then you have a split between those people and the suits. And some companies overcome that and some companies don't. But that's the dilemma behind Porsche right now that we talked about earlier. Yeah. You know, here's a company that was known for building these really wonky sports cars with the engine in the wrong spot, but more and more of their cars are not wonky sports cars with the engine in the wrong spot, and well, that's what people are going to identify them. But you can understand, I understand Lincoln's reluctance because uh, it is, it's, a, it's not a 10-year program, it's not even a 15-year program, it's about a 30-year program because... That's why Cadillac is about half the way there now. Yeah, they're only halfway because, uh, you know, I was talking to a young friend in uh, Los Angeles, very trendy guy, 28, very into cars, um, has an Audi A5. And he's like, I kind of like a Cadillac ATS, but I just can't quite do it. It's not socially acceptable in the world I run in. You yeah. know, it's just... It's, and, and we it's, know that. I mean, yeah. you pull up to the country club or, or wherever, the restaurant, valet, 
and certain brands have cachet, more cachet than others. And, uh, you and have brands to can come back. back. I mean, look at what happened with Gucci. It didn't take that long. You know, yeah. it, it takes years, though, for a car company to it reverse it's, it's interesting if you look at Audi. Audi, for decades, I mean, coming from the unintended acceleration fiasco, and then they did, remember, they reset the company with the B5A4 in 1996. That was the car that yep. sort of repositioned yep. everything. Yep. So they started at the bottom of the range. And over time, they've, they've become now a, a tier one, but they've done it with what they've done with the A8 and the R8 did a tremendous amount. And the racing. But, it, but, but if you the, think Audi, of it, the R8 changed perception of the people that don't know about racing. If you think of the A6 from 1996, that was a, a design triumph because what was the car yeah. before was the Audi 80 or the Audi, Audi 90? Or, 100. Or the 100. 100. 100. Essentially, similar proportions, similar powertrains, similar feature content. Are you that, talking about the round tail car? Yeah. yeah. About the, that. Yes. That, there was actually one, an A6 before that. No, I'm, talking uh, the, I'm, yeah. talking, I'm talking the A4. I oh, said, A4. I, I that, the A4. Yeah. Well, the there A4, was an A4. Yeah. The A4 that came out in 96. But you're talking, you're talking about the A4 the was seminal, but the A6 was more of a design. It was, uh, but the, I, the A4 is the car that reset them. Yeah. yeah. And it did it in Germany, too. It brought their median age in Germany way down, because before that, Audis were retirees cars. Mm -hmm. And that was a car they called the black turtleneck car, because suddenly yeah. these people that were in their 30s are buying Audis. Yeah. And it was all around the B5 Generation A4. I still remember the 5000. Oh, I do too. Yeah. It was a handsome car. The Aero 5000. The flush yeah. glass. Yep. Oh, that had everybody in design yeah. coming like, what did they do? How'd they do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember. It, it had, it had bad, uh, it was a nice design on a poor architecture. The wheels were bad tucked stance. into the body. Yeah. It had no stance yeah. at all. And that's why when they came out with the Audi, one, or the, um, the Audi V8, which... That was about ninety-two. design language. Yeah. Um, Stance was right. Right, because they, they had to put a bigger, yeah, bigger. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, it, the thing is that they did it with, a, Audi did it. Racing is fine, but you know what? The majority of people that are buying Audis don't know don't about, know about but that's my point. So they set it with product. And they did it with two outstanding products. The A8 is outstanding simply because it was the luxury car that was different from the other luxury cars that were out there, the German luxury cars. And the R8, because the R8 was the first really usable Super. mid-engine supercar. Mm -hmm. Okay, does Cadillac need one, a car like that? Does it need a, a car to basically bitch slap the public and say, look, here's a Cadillac? And when uh, you go into the mid-engine space, you, you, you better be... As much as I, you know, on. as you much as win. I like so. the mid-engine thing, that's not the... No, no, I'm not saying it, but the but bitch slap car the, doesn't have to be that car. Well, no, that's not the hero Cadillac I would look for. And, they, and you tried XLR, and it didn't really I would take. look for a car based on some, something off the CLL Mirage that was such a statement, a visual statement, uh, big though, sedan, that would be unmistakably Cadillac. Yep. Something that would sear in the public's imagination that, wow. There's a Cadillac coming out in the future that actually could do a lot to change the perception of the desirability of Cadillac in some markets, and it's the ELR. I actually think the ELR is going to do The ELR great. is expensive enough. If it is exclusive enough and hard to get, there will be people that will say, uh, that's the hot thing I to get. I think it might do well in the touchy-feely enclaves that Joe was speaking about. Well, there's about. the technical story there, and that goes back to, I talked about consistency, the art and science, the art of the beauty of that body and the interior and the technology of the powertrain. It's a great story, and it's a great fit I for I just Cadillac. wish they would have put the new Family 4 in it instead of the same engine. Tell us about the Cadillac uh, badge. Your experiments there. Yeah, and the El Mirage, which was interesting. There ain't no wreath on it. <laughs> really, I hadn't noticed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. I, that, the El Mirage is a concept, and we test all sorts of things. And, and, um, and that was done uh, Frank Soseda's studio in L.A.? Frank, yeah, Frank Soseda's team did the El Mirage. And, and the badge on that concept, you know, again, it's just a concept. But what I like about that particular badge is the aspect ratio. Right. It's, yeah. it's a predominantly it horizontal yeah. graphic Horiz form. It's a horizontal graphic for the badge, a horizontal graphic for the for the grill. So it's a it's a nice thought starter for how to design the front end of a Cadillac. But, you know, it's funny. If you look at the proportion of that badge, you look at what Cadillac did with the wreath and crest. Over, <sighs> or actually, the crest, because the wreath didn't come until the 60s. Over they were decade. all over this place. The, you look at the 57 brome, some of them are squashed aspect ratio like that. And then in the, in the interior, it was a tall one, a tall, thin one with the, with the uh, V underneath it. Mm -hmm. So we have a history of, of just the heraldry in Cadillac. If you go back to the, the 30s and you look at how it's evolved, there was never any doubt it was a Cadillac yeah. logo, though. I mean, but they, they had the ones with the Egyptian wings on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, they had spectacular stuff. So I, I think that, that that concept badge that we showed us is a great design. It's a great thought starter. Like I said, I was expecting a lot more people in the media to 
may comment out on about it. But uh, it's interesting because the two primary players in the luxury space, the German players, both have round logos. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it's sort of easy to. Yeah, but I'm just saying, and, 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 and you know, with Mercedes, you know, it goes back to when it was, in fact, the, the radiator cap. But, but the thing is, they're using round graphics, and they have to reiterate that in however they use it in the car. You know, BMW, with this obsession now with the surfboard line in the hood. It's, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, you know, the luxury, then, then you've got the, the Audi logo that's predominantly horizontal, but again, mm -hmm. based on circular system. I just think, uh, you know, I, 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 when I saw it on the car, I thought it was really handsome, and I thought it was a... It's still recognizable as a cap. It's nicely crest. proportioned. And it's a little bit more youthful, I think. Because some of the uh, design sketches still showed it with a uh, circular logo on it, I saw. Oh. Yeah. The, the stuff they passed out to us. Oh. By the way, um, before we take a little break, people think the ELR is just another CTS coupe look. ELR yeah, looks really oh, vastly. Different. Yeah, ELR uh, looks very different. I think when people see it on the road, yeah. they're really going to notice that have, windshield is so far forward and uh, the, the backlight's so flat. Yeah. Well, and, and the dimensions are so much more compact. And um, the, the wheel size, and the 20 inch wheels on that short wheelbase, is, they really pop. I was like, convinced they were going to go to a smaller wheel tire on it. I really was, just for it's just it, Cadillac. When's, that, on, when's that going on sale? Uh, saleable vehicles, I think, um, fourth quarter of this year, so I thought. think. Yeah, we haven't, I haven't seen one on the road yet. We've got a neighbor a that brought one home a couple so of times. So we should be going trying. to Longleat and Carmel for that car, right? Something <laughs> like that. Let's take a break. Uh, ben, let's hear from our friends at Hyundai. What's my type? Well, they have to be smart. Uh, a good sense of direction good taste in music, and, of course, good looks with nice curves. That gets my temperature rising every time we touch. And that exotic name, Elantra. Wait, are we talking about cars? To clear it in the fender. All right, we're back. Hmm. Thanks again to the boys and girls at Hyundai. So, Bob, give me, give me a kind of the high hard ones of your background. How long have you been at GM? And I will have my 10-year anniversary at GM in January of this year. I spent uh, about 12 years at Chrysler right. prior to coming to GM. Um, background, what have I worked on? It? Uh, let's see. Well, when I joined GM, well, let's go back to Chrysler. What did you work on Chrysler? The first car I worked on at Chrysler was the second-generation Dodge Intrepid. That was the uh, first car that I was on, listed on the patent. Uh, the Jeep Liberty, the original one with the eyebrow on the hood, that was the eye, you know, on the... Uh, hood 2001. 2001. 2002. It came out in 01, yeah. 2002. I was the uh, lead on that car as well. And then I moved into the, um, like, sort of the architecture studio working with Freeman Thomas, and we worked on the, we put the 300C architecture together. You know, Freeman never got much credit for that car. The but concept the, car? The production car. Well, the, the pre-production vision model, which actually we called... Uh, um, what do we call it? Because the concept, I, I forget what the concept was called. That we, we called it, well, we did the pre-production one was called the Nassau, which was actually a fiberglass oh. model that was on display at the Chrysler. You think of the Hemi Soup Rate, yeah. Yeah. which was done in parallel. I love that. So, so, so I worked with Freeman on that, um, worked on stow and go seats for minivans and so forth, which I think was the last thing I worked That's on. Very useful. So I moved to, moved to uh, General Motors, and I took over the uh, advanced studio, and the first project I worked on there was the GM sequel, which was a hydrogen fuel cell concept car. Mm. We built the concept, then we built two... Oh, high, high wires? No, no, that, no. that no. predated no. me. Okay. Uh, we built two drivable ones, and they demonstrated a 300-mile zero emissions range on public roads, first vehicle to do that. Then I worked on the Volt, well, Camaro. We did eight worked 18 months on the Camaro concept that was... Someday I'll tell you that was the high and low point in my design <laughs> career. Um, all in one. All in one. Uh, Volt concept, Volt production. Um, then the current uh, Lambda vehicles, the new Acadia, Enclave, and Traverse, those mid-cycle refresh. The, the mid-cycle, okay. So the, not the original no, no, uh, the, the Acadia one, that was a Pontiac originally. Th yeah, no, the new one with the blunt nose. Yeah. Uh, those, that's that's I, using I, Saturn sheet metal, isn't it? For the, the quarters and so on? It does. Yeah, and it was a brilliant use of the material. It's interesting. One of our young designers came to me, and he said, you know, we, we were sketching on that program, and he said, the GMC terrain actually has wraparound glass in the back. And he said, what's interesting is the, 
you know, there was a high, high level of commonality between the Saturn and the Acadia, anyway, common doors, common lift gate, and so forth. He said, you know, if we use the body in white, the quarter of the Saturn, which we're not building any longer, it, the graphic signature of the two vehicles will be largely the same. So the front end, it was all new front end sheet metal, new interior, and so forth. So really, it was just a quarter panel share with the uh, outgoing Saturn. So I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant move. Um, so any back to the history after that, I moved to the Cadillac studio in January of 2011. And so the CTS is actually the first Cadillac that I had my hands on. So that's my, uh, that's 20, that's 20 years, 20, 21 and a half years and in what, 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and El Mirage was done in El, in Frank's, California. Yeah, Frank Sacedo's group but in built California. But here. Built your... here in our shops. Yeah. So, uh, and Frank and our good friends. Frank's actually in town right now. He's is he's going back tomorrow. Frank's another uh, was an Italian car freak. Now he's all into that British stuff for a while. Weird he was, British stuff. He, he was, had an Ariel Adam. Yeah, he did. Well, he was into the German stuff, and then he got into the Italian stuff, and now he's into the British stuff. I, you know, that's that's interesting because I've been sort of drawn to the British stuff lately. Uh, I saw so many beautiful E types at. Uh, out west. Well, even the e new just disturbs me because of the, the it, it, it's too common. It's a beautiful car. The wheels are tucked under it, and it there's, it's underbodied. It, it's, but the other thing is the E-Type. There's this absurd thing where a BJ8 Austin Healey will get more money. It's more expensive than an E-Type, mm, which the, is nuts. It's crazy. <clears throat> I didn't tell you what I really like. I like the E-Type, but I, I really like a, an XK120. Oh yeah, 120 is beautiful. Yeah. A 120 yeah. coupe with steel wheels and spats to me yeah, is just spats. the bee's knees, but <clears throat> about as small as the chair you're sitting in. Oh, yeah, you, have, you, have you ever driven one? No. With the, the steering wheel is here. I mean, they're, 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 the coupes are really tough. That's but, what was on at the quail in cream color. It was just yeah. gorgeous, but yeah, it was I, so small. I was always raised to think that, to be, that British cars were just, they were close, they were engineered beautifully on paper, but the execution just wasn't there. Well, they didn't hold a candle to the Italians. I mean, obviously what the Italians were doing in the 50s and, yeah. you know. Well, the uh, Brits came up with drum break or yeah, disc brakes. Disc brakes. Disc brakes. Bill Mitchell would bring the latest Italian yeah. coach builder stuff and put it in the patio at GM Design. And but when you were talk, we were talking earlier about, sorry to bring it back to the present, but uh, a, a big luxury car that's not German, I was thinking about Jaguar XJ. Mm -hmm which they have filled that space. It's exactly the right car that hits the... the it's the anti-German luxury exactly. car. Exactly, and it hits a lot of the luxury car emotions that mm -hmm. Americans should like. Unfortunately, they still can't sell the damn things. Yeah. It's beautiful. Well, but it's that's, in, that's beautiful the, the horror of consideration. It's brilliant to drive. It's both soft and luxurious and Jaguar-like, but you could drive it down a good road uh, but behind a 7 Series. Jag lost consideration in the luxury Completely. market when they kept making the same car over and over and over and, and over again. I, I also find anytime I have a Jag and I uh, encounter a friend or family or don't know about modern cars, they're like, oh, Jaguar. Uh, you know, I had an uncle, I had a friend who had one of those. They're, 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 they're nice, but they're horrible, aren't they? And well, it, that's how long it takes to get rid of residual. In the 1980s, they were bottom of the J.D. Power, yeah. late 80s. I mean, that's like totally. 25 years Totally, and it, those residuals, effect, uh, that residual reputation lingers For forever decades. and ever. Yeah, there's, some, there's some quirky things, though, on the XJ. You know, that C-pillar applique is a lot. And to me... Doesn't that, it look like the C-pillar should have been body color? It, well, I think, or, I think they're hiding a weld joint there. I understand. The, but, but you've got a, 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 yeah. the DLO molding... Wants to do something different. Black yeah. to black, and it's like... Well, it looks best on a black... Uh, um, and, a model. Yeah, and to know. me, that gauge cluster looks like a cartoon. The fake horizon lines and, and the build quality in the interior, just, you know, that little tray in the back. I admire place. their use of color. They're yeah. pretty brave with their color, very anti-German. Um, and, th and their cars are just, they're really good to drive. The XJ is great yeah. to drive. You know? All right, well, we could talk about this for another three days, but let's, uh, let's go to rapid fire, Ben, so we can get some questions from our viewers. Here we go. Alexander Karabitsas, two questions. Why didn't Cadillac do a V-Sport for the ATS before the CTS? With the true flagship car coming and with the launch of the new CTS, how will the XTS be positioned in the lineup? Well, uh, XTS is still our big car in the lineup. Right. You know, and there's still, um, 
there's still two Cadillac customers out there. You know, we we're courting one with the um, the driver's cars and so forth. And the XTS is a, is, a, is a nice driving vehicle too. But a lot of folks out there that want the big luxury car, and the XTS is a great luxury car. And, and the V Sport version with the all-wheel drive and the 410 horsepower, that car is a remarkable driving vehicle. So it's dynamically very different from the CTS that's here on the floor, and they appeal to a different customer. But uh, yeah, I just drove the VTS uh, or XTS. V Sport, um, and I was quite impressed by it. You know, it it, it will appeal to a, a traditional yeah. Cadillac buyer, but somebody who actually wants to drive, yeah, drive, not just yeah. It it's, it was pretty good. Ray Schaefer asks: Cadillac provides wonderful names for their gorgeous concept cars and style, which thankfully finds its way to the showroom. Why can't we have provocative names for the production cars? Yeah, Any we, chance that can happen? Well, we talk about that quite a bit, you know, and. Um, it's a challenge because so many names are, there's patents or copyright infringement and so forth. So it's tough to come up with a name that's both provocative and not used by someone else. Having said that, our um, alphanumeric, if you will, uh, um, coding, it, it works now. But as we start to add portfolio entries, it gives us pause and we think about what our naming convention is going to be so so stay tuned you know we may we may talk about that you know you look at escalate escalate is a I was name say, you, you didn't call that an, an escalate is a name X, so, xx <laughs> right and and so i think there's a place for both there's a place for vehicles with iconic names and there's a place for uh sequencing i guess you would say bmw has a sequence audi has a sequence mercedes has a sequence we have a sequence you still have the patent on fleetwood um, I'm not sure if we do. I don't know if I would use that name. Though. I'm just, it was kind of a joke. We had a 66 Fleetwood when I was a kid. We also had a 66 Sedan DeVille. And by the way, I'm in the market for a 66 Cadillac because I think it was one of the last true metal leather. Then you know the one you want is a 66 Eldo. Oh, Eldorado convertible. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that was the last of the full-size Eldos. And uh, it had yeah, that this strange wood panel on the inside oh, that, of the door. Like I didn't a like cutting it. Board. So I like a DeVille convertible, actually, so... If you know anyone who has one, let me know. I know a guy that has an Elder convertible, but... Okay. Uh, I would rather see the American car companies go in another direction and start using names. I certainly sympathize with the, uh, the viewer's question because, you know, I do this for a living, and the letter X is in mm -hmm. almost every car now, and Q now is more and more, and I can barely keep track of them, and I'm supposed to know. So I don't know how the consumers do. Then at Port Lincoln, you have some that alliteratively sound similar. Yes. You know, yeah. MKX, MKS. What? Yeah. You know, MKT, yeah. MKZ. You know, I, I, yeah. I'm sensitive to that, and I, I like a vehicle with a name. But I, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. We try, and so stay tuned. This, this gentleman, Joseph Ann, is frustrated with Ford Kinetic design and other similar wraparound designs because... The wraparound lights reflect the sunlight, so in a parking lot, these new cars look like they all have the taillight reverse light. <laughs> I've noticed that, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, part of it is you're going to taillight lenses where the actual red lens is clear, where it used to be faceted, which would diffuse that a little bit, but now with a lot of clear lenses and some rather convoluted forms underneath, those things are reflecting, What's too. Probably, I mean, he's pausing because he thinks someone is backing, backing out up, and I want him. that spot, yeah. Yeah, and no. All right, we got some phone calls. Ben, let's let's hear one of those. Hi, this is Jonathan Brown out in Old Japan. Fabulous, fabulous show. Uh, the El Dorado, I mean the El Mirage is a beautiful, beautiful car. Look forward to it coming to production. Uh, my question is for you guests with regards to the new CTS. The new one is so low and lean as compared to the second gen, which is much more a Bentley-esque or uh, substantial in its design philosophy. Is there any chance you can give us like a, a one-minute synopsis of the design change philosophy of the new CPS? Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Well, I could talk about the dimensions and I could talk about the philosophy. I mean, the CTS you see here on the floor is almost five inches longer. The roof is three-quarters of an inch lower. The cowl is actually a full inch lower. And so people say, well, an inch. An inch is a lot that, in that a vehicle. Helps. And especially because it's now farther back. Right. We've got more dashed axle. In other words, the windshield's back, the wheels are forward, and the wheelbase is longer. So we say lower, longer, leaner. The car is much, the aspect ratio of it, both in front view and side view, is, is more 
landscape format, if you will. Um, the philosophy of the vehicle is just that. I mean, a vehicle that looks lighter is going to be appear to be more of a driver's vehicle. And it actually, as a design, it gives us a chance to actually get some lyricism into these, these uh, character lines. The second generation CTS was a handsome car, but the shoulder line, if you will, stopped right at the side view mirror. Yeah, this car, it had that big notch there. Right, so with the third generation, we've taken the line right up from the light guide on the front uh, from the headlamp, and it runs uninterrupted all the way along the belt. So it not only is the vehicle physically longer and leaner, the line work that we put on the car makes it look, even longer, make it look even longer and thinner. So the car is really graceful looking out on the road, and, I, and graceful in here as well, but yeah. that's the philosophy. Ben, let's have that other phone call. Hey, John and Peter, this is Auto Freelancer calling from New Jersey. Just want to say, great show, guys, and I just have a question for you. Jay Mays um, from Ford Design said the new Mustang is going to be not be an evolution of the of the current Mustang. So I'm just wondering your thoughts. Will the ev will the Mustang be um, revolutionary or evolutionary? And also, I just wanted to note that on the last Auto Line, um, all the the new sports cars that you guys wanted to pick were um, all mid engines or engines in the rear of the driver, at the back of the driver. So thanks, guys, for the great show, and keep up the good work. I think the Mustang's going to be sort of a... It's not an evolution of the existing car. No. It's but a it's new, similar to it's current a new, Fords. And well, it's a new car, but it is a Mustang when you see it. They, it was, and it's a Ford. Uh, some spy pictures came out just this week. It looks very much like the Evos concept, uh, and it does have an independent rear suspension, which is, yeah. which is the most important thing about the car. Yeah. 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 And it, can, it will continue to be, of the pony cars that are out there now, the three that are out there, it will continue to be the smallest and the lightest. All right. Next Thank generation, God. with Thank a couple God of them, that, that won't be the case. So does anyone even talk about swivel bucket seats in the car bed? <laughs> <laughs> That's from not so much. Well, not so much. We No, they don't. GM had the last cars to have swivel bucket Laguna? seats. Yeah, Laguna? Yeah, uh, Laguna S3. Well, you know, it's a great... Feature, but you think about all the safety. Side regulations. impact now. I don't know how you do it. Side impact yeah. and, and, was, and seats are structural now. They're part yeah. of they're part of the impact event this now. This is purely for ingress and egress. Yeah, yeah. And they were they worked really well. It was a very it was it was a very functional thing to have in a car. But honestly, in side impact alone, because you'd have to still have that structure of the seat down in the bottom, and then how you would attach that on a swiveling plate would be some especially uh, useful if you're wearing a formal gown, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think when the, those vehicles, I think Chrysler had it in the late 50s. Chrysler it, had them first, yeah. A huge step over, too, so it was actually hard to get in. We've, we've reduced our step over as much as possible in these vehicles, so I think cars of today well, are a little easier to get in and out. You learned something with the first SRX, which had awful step over at launch. Well, that had a huge rocker, and then yeah. they did a mid-cycle where they, where they moved the section, and they, and they and moved, they moved it the seats onto the out, too. Well, they moved it onto the door of yeah. that section. Every Ford and Lincoln sold today has a huge step over, or the ones, not every Ford, but all the ones on the, uh, the old Volvo. Using platform. the Volvo. Oh, SIPs architecture, yeah. yeah. It drives me crazy. Oh, you got long legs? Come on. I know, but it's just like, it just doesn't compute when you look at it and step over it. So. Scott in Cleveland asks, has there ever been any thoughts at Cadillac on resurrecting the XLR off of the C7? <clears throat> no comment. <laughs> Mm. We always look. We always talk about somebody performance. must have thought about it. I we mean. always talk about performance variants and and do we replace this car or that car from our past? Of course, we think about things like that, but we've certainly made no decision on anything like that. Yeah. And even if we had, I wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't tell anyone here. Yeah. Well, that I'll, makes me think of Buick Riviera. What's happening with that? I know Buick it's not Riviera. your. You talking about the one that we showed in uh, Shanghai? Well, more like. I, I, Reading the tea leaves, I think that Buick is going to do a Riviera. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think they are. I, you know, I, I think GM Design does great work. That wasn't one of my favorite concepts. I don't mean that one, but the name. Uh, you know, if they're going to have Buick, they I'm, need. I'm just looking at my shoes. That's all. Why is that? I'm just looking at my shoes. That's all. You like that car? Uh, no, God, the concept? No. No, I didn't either. But I, I like the name, and I think Buick needs that. If they're going to do they Buick, they need, need a Riviera. car. They, they absolutely need Riviera. I mean, that's, talk about heritage of the company. Yeah, but if you want to do that, they, they, Buick could use a modern Riviera, whatever a postmodern Riviera is. It may be a four-door. Cadillac could use an Eldorado. And the truth is, Chevrolet could use a Bel Air instead of a Code 130R. <laughs> we don't have a Code 130R. 
<laughs> concept. Yeah, they're saying, but if... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand, well, You know, we've reached the end of the road. Is that it? Yeah, Already? as you know, yeah, we could talk about design and this stuff for hours, uh, but we do have, it's an hour show, allegedly. But everyone, uh, out, everyone out in the world and uh, the internet has their lighter out, right? Yeah. For encore. <laughs> you know, I'd really like to thank Bob Boniface from uh, Cadillac Design. Bob, it's great. Always, always a pleasure to see always you. Always fun to talk to you guys. Joe DiMaggio from Automobile. Pleasure. Thanks, Joe, for being here. And Jim Hall, the man who knew too much, 2953 <laughs> Analytics. Uh, you can see my stuff at Auto Extremist, blah, blah, blah. You can friend Autoline at Facebook.com slash Autoline Network. And you can follow Autoline or on Twitter at twitter.com slash Autoline. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you next week. Autoline After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. And by the 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Learn more at Hyundai.com. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with Autoline Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.